But Psalms chapter number 42, verse number 1, <clears throat> the Bible says, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so painteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now the psalmist in these verses, we know that it was a song written to the or written by to the chief musician, to the sons of Korah, that they might sing it in the house of God as praise and worship unto God. Well, knowing that, this isn't a psalm of I mean everything in the book, this isn't a song to make you feel better. This is a song to give God and praise glory. Right? Too often we think that songs are to put us in a certain spirit or a certain mood. No, our, our praise, our worship towards God is to edify the very holy name of Jehovah. Too often we get caught up in what the songs do for us. The real question, the difference between nowadays, songs that have power on them and songs that don't have power on them that sound just like songs in the world. The difference is, is that those that have power, those that mean something, are those that glorify God. As long as the sole purpose of the song is to give God glory, praise, and honor for what He's done, what He's going to do, or the fact that you believe God's going to do something, that's when God shows up and inhabits the praise of His people. The whole purpose of praise unto God is that, one, He deserves it. Two, if we're commanded to do it. Three, if we don't do it, the Bible says that the rocks will cry out in our place. I did a devotion on that one time. I don't want to be replaced by a rock. Right? But four, in obedience to praise God, God honors obedience with His presence. So here in verse number one, it says, As the heart, or the deer, panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? We have in verse number one and the beginning of verse number two statements. These aren't negotiable, these are facts. He says, As the heart panteth for the water brook. Then he says, So my or so painteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Those are not negotiable. The writer of this psalm says all these things are true. If a deer gets thirsty, where does it go? To a brook. He says, so my soul, in like manner, my soul thirsteth. So the only thing that I desire is God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. He says, I'm not looking for a deity. I'm looking for the Alpha and Omega. Right? The I am that I am. That's what Jehovah means, by the way, the living one. Because he's the only God that has eyes that can see, ears that can hear, a mouth that can speak. The rest of them are imaginations of man's mind. He says, my soul painteth for something real. The living God. But then we see his desire. When shall I come and appear before God? He says, I desire to be satisfied by God, so when will I have that appointment with God? He's saying, Lord, I need you, but when am I going to find you? He's saying, I'm thirsty. I need a drink, so where's the water? That, that word panteth in verse number 1. Doesn't mean that he's craving it. Right? We crave ice cream. Right? Some of y'all crave sugar, snacks. Weird people like crave vegetables. I don't understand them people. Okay. Right? We crave sweet things. Right? We crave fruit, things that are pleasant to eat. Right? Nobody says, sign me up for a mouthful of salt today, right? That's bitter. But see, that panteth, that's not a desire. It's not a craving. It's not something that he's wishing for. It's something that you need. You, 
don't go study a deer. That sounds weird. But go do some reading on deer. Go watch the Nature Channel, whichever one you got. Right, or go watch some of them hunting channels. Deers don't move quick very often. If a deer's running, it's either because it's spooked, because it's hurt, or because something's trying to hurt it. Okay, before a hunter fires a bow or fires a gun, the deer's not running because there's nothing wrong. The deer only pants, which is what? Breathing heavy. Something on the outside of the world has caused the inside of the deer to have to do everything that it could to get away, and now it's exhausted. When the deer starts panting after the water, it's because it needs the water or it's going to die. Right? It don't take much running nowadays to get me to the point where I'm like, water. Water. Right? What's the number one rule if you're going to go exercise or if you're going to play a sport? Stay hydrated. What are you trying to do? You're trying to stave off panting for water. See, it doesn't matter what kind of animal it is. If it don't have water, it's going to die. But if you've been running every which way but loose, you're going to die a whole lot quicker without water. Right? The reason that we don't run everywhere and we have vehicles, right? if we run everywhere, one, that require work, and most of us don't like that. But if we were to run everywhere, we'd have to drink a whole lot more water throughout the day. Because in order to go and exert yourself, in order to go out and to run, right, as a deer would, it means that you're giving up all of the things that you had stored away on the inside of you. They tell me that we're about 70% water. I don't, like, I don't understand how that's true when bones are as big as they are, but anyway. They say we're made up 70% of water. They say that if you were hydrated well beforehand, you could probably go about three days without water before you die. That's how much is in you at any given moment. But if you start exerting yourself, if you start contending against something, if you start striving against something, and you have to put out that effort, that water's not going to last three days. If you're out in the middle of a desert, doesn't matter how well hydrated you were at the start, the sun's going to suck as much moisture as it can out of you through sweat. Right? The deer that's panting for the water brook is a deer that's going to die if it doesn't get water soon. It's got enough energy left to know that I need to get to somewhere where water is. That's the panting that it's talking about. Now, it's not deer, but I've watched a whole bunch of Discovery Channel and Animal Planet as a kid. You don't ever see a gazelle move quick out in Africa unless what? A lion jumps out at it. The rest of the time, they're just walking around, meandering around, eating and chewing on grass. Just living their life. Well, all throughout this world, there are Christians that intended on getting up and just walking and grazing on the grass. Then all of a sudden, something gets on their trail, and they got to run. Sometimes you'll hear a deerling, right? you'll, you'll hear Bambi go, Wah. right? And then you'll see Mama Deer come running. Why? Because something that she cares about has said, hey, I need help. So she'll exert herself to save the child. There are things that you care about in this world that you're willing to run as hard as you can because you want to see God do something in that person's life or to move in a certain aspect, in a certain situation. You're willing to go out and to give up the carnal pleasures of the world. You're willing to deprive yourself of things that you might desire or want to spend time in your prayer closet, to spend time in meditation on the things of God, just trying to move the heart of God to do something in a situation. That's tiring. 
Did not Jesus say, man cannot serve two masters or love one and hate the other? You're either all in or you're all out. Either you're in six gear going as hard as you can or your heart isn't in it. Now, now, Jesus does know every one of our limitations. Right? Hallelujah. 23rd Psalm. He maketh me lie down in green pasture. When we want to keep going, he says, you can't go on. Take a little bit of a rest. But when he puts us down in that green pasture, where are we right next to? The water. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Why? Because we're panting. And each and every one of you have a point that you can keep going, and then all of a sudden, it's like a switch goes off in your head. And instead of thinking about your next step, you're thinking about where your next drink's going to come from. Where's the water? Right five minutes ago, I was happy running, but now I've run so much that I need a drink. I need something to refresh my soul. Well, the psalmist says, so panteth my soul after thee, O Lord. Just as that deer knows that it's going to die or it's not going to be able to continue running the way that it was before without a drink of water, Lord, my soul's gotten to the point that I can't spiritually keep running without you. Now we know that the Holy Ghost inhabits us. We know that Jesus said, if any man drink of the water that I give him, it'll be a well springing up within him. We know that there's the living water, but every now and then, you know that you need a drink. Okay, think of that widow woman that the prophet came by. She said, I was going to make a cake for me and my son, and we was going to eat it and die. He said, well, give it to me first. But see, she didn't think about the cruiser oil or the meal pot until what? Until she got hungry again. And every time, by faith, she knew that it was empty because she scraped every last bit out of it last time. But by faith, she said, Lord, we're hungry again, and she had to go scoop again, and there's enough to feed them for another day. I know that we have a well of water springing up inside of us, but once you get to running, right? once you get your face set towards Jesus and you start marching, the Word of God's still bubbling. It's still springing up. But you're saying, Lord, I need a special drink of water. I don't you. You know me. Diet Mountain Dew all the way. Right? But there are days that I look at Diet Mountain Dew and I say, that's not what I need. Right? There's a special drink that when your soul is weary, when you think that you can't go any further, God's got a special cup that He fills up with water and what's it do? It restores your soul we're not talking about the day to day man should not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God we're talking about when you're about ready to break God has a drink that will give you the refreshment to go on another mile he said if any man can pay you to go with him a mile go with him twain but our Savior only asks that we live for him some people have purpose that they're going to live and run for them. And when they get to the end of that second mile and they're saying, Lord, I can't go anymore without you, he says, here you go. That well, that's, you're still saved. That well's still springing up unto everlasting life. The Bible's just as true. All those verses that you love are just as sweet. But there's a special drink. Right? Because God doesn't do anything you know mediocre he doesn't do anything in a manner that you know he takes one blessing and then tries to divide it in half and use it for two no God has a specific thing whatever it is to meet whatever need it is in your life he's curtailed it custom made to you he knows exactly what you need he's not going to give you anything less the drink that you need today may be different than the drink that you need tomorrow. But I know whatever drink that He gives you, it's going to be just what you need. But nothing will be left unsatisfied. You know why the deer pants for the water? Because the deer knows that it needs the water in order to keep being a deer. Otherwise, it's going to be turned into venison. 
You know why the heart of a Christian pants after God? Because it knows in order to keep being a Christian, it needs that drink from God. Now some people get thirsty and instead of looking towards God, they try to find something to satisfy from the world. They become castaways. They become backslid. They try to substitute. Right? Water is water. You can make it fizzy. You can make it whatever flavor you want it to. It's just water. You can add stuff to it. All them vitamins and electrolytes and everything else they start putting in it. You just need water. Water's worked since the beginning. Water's going to work today. Don't need to reinvent the wheel. Don't need to have a new program to get people revived. You just need to drink. The deer's panting, but it knows that the water's going to make it stop panting. That means that it's going to go from tired to refreshed. It means that it's going to go from as hard as it could go and can't go no more to it can go a little bit further. There's a change in the water, in that drink. The change is that what the deer was, it is no more. It's no longer tired. It's no longer exhausted. It's no longer thirsty. If you get thirsty, all you can think about is how thirsty you are. But if you can still think about other stuff that's going on and thirsty is just the thought that, like, hmm, I'm a little thirsty, but then you go on to think, you're not thirsty. When you're hungry, really hungry, all you can think about is how hungry you are. You can't think about anything else. Every moment, every second of what's going on is your stomach churning in on itself, trying to find something down there that it can turn into food, and it's causing you pain, discomfort. Every thought is, hey, we need more food. The same is true for water. If you get thirsty enough, you'll start looking anywhere for water. The water that you wouldn't have drank yesterday, you might drink today if that's all you can find. Now, don't throw off on people that have found themselves, well, once they're sitting on a church pew and today they're not. I don't know how thirsty they got. I know that God could have satisfied it. But don't judge me until you've walked in his shoes. If you've never been to the point that you're so thirsty that you're looking at rusty, mildewy water and that's all you can find, if you get desperate enough, you'll drink it. Because you know, without something, you're going to die. Well, it says, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Why is that water from God so different? Because it's alive. Everything that he touches is life. Not only did he breathe into man the breath of life, he is life. Always has been alive, always will be forevermore. Everything that he touches is infused with what? His life. Why do you think salvation was so special? Because God gave it to you. If man gave it to you, it'd be just as dead as you were. But it came from the living God. That's why your salvation made you alive. That's why it's called the second birth. He must be born again, as he told Nicodemus. You must receive life. Well, once you've had life, you know life can't be found out there. He says, my soul painted that after the living God, because life was the only thing that satisfied me yesterday, and in order to be satisfied today, I'm going to need more life. Well, is it going to come from me? No, because this, this flesh is dead and trespasses the sin. Every work of my hands, right, if done to myself, is cursed with the fact that it's not permanent. Nothing I do in and of myself, the arm of flesh will fail me. Solomon said he looked at every work of man. He says it's vanity. It's all just going to pass away eventually. But see, a drink from the living God will restore you to what? What you were. Well, what's that drink? Well, sometimes people never get the drink of water 
because they never address what caused them to go thirsty in the first place. Without the confession, there is no forgiveness. A cup of water can be sitting right there for you, but you know you got to admit that what you did was wrong to get it. Pride keeps people thirsty. But I don't want to admit that I did the wrong thing. I don't want to admit that I'm the reason that I went thirsty. Sometimes you get thirsty because you're going as hard as you can for God. Other times you get thirsty because you haven't been drinking the right water. As much as I like Diet Mountain Dew, they tell me that because it's got sodium in it, it makes you more thirsty than when you started. It's got water in there. It's the first ingredient. Uh, second ingredient, if you look on a bottle of Diet Mountain Dew, it says concentrated orange juice. That's why it's healthy for you. You can take that to the bank. But no, you scroll down the list, you're going to find sodium and a whole bunch of other things I can't pronounce. It's got water in it, but water with salt is still salt water. What happens if you go out and you start drinking ocean water? Your stomach's going to boil up. It's going to kill you. Right, there are things that taste good to the flesh, but all they're doing is, for a moment, it'll make you feel refreshed, but what happens in the long run, it makes you more exhausted. We've said water is water. You don't need to add nothing to it. Right, but why does the world have to add things to the drinks that they're giving you to try and cover up whatever flavor they don't want you to notice? Y'all ever pay attention? Read, like it'll be lemon water, right? Go and look on there. It'll say, with natural and artificial flavoring. Well, what's the natural flavor? That's the lemon. What's the artificial flavoring? That's to cancel out the taste of all the other gunk that they put in there so that all you taste is the lemon. They got to cover their tracks because it's not just water with lemon in it. You know what water and lemon tastes like? Lemon water. But you know what water and lemon and all that other stuff tastes like? Not lemon water. So they got to add stuff to make it not taste like the junk so it just tastes like lemon water. But if the list of ingredients is longer than, you know, the width of your hand, mm, something funky going on there. But why does it need so much? Because they're trying to hide something. Or they're trying to make it last longer. They're trying to preserve it. Well, every drink that I get from God is fresh and new. Doesn't need to be preserved. Doesn't need to get to the point where it could go bad. Why? Because everything he touches is alive. It's fresh. But see, some people don't want to admit that what they had been drinking, they didn't have the right amount of water. Doesn't matter how much water you drink in a day. Or it doesn't matter the fact that you took drink of water during the day. What matters is how much water you've gotten throughout the day. That is another thing, Brother Ryan. I don't know if I believe it, but this is what they tell me. They say if you take your weight and divide it in half, you're supposed to drink that many ounces of water every day. That's a lot. Especially for me. It's a lot more than some of you. But it ain't a gallon, but it's more than what I thought I'd need. But in my head, if I drink that much water, I'm not going to be able to do anything else except drink water and then go to the bathroom. But you need more water than you really think. Well, I had a cup of water yesterday. Yeah, and what else did you do? Because I know you just didn't live off of one cup of water yesterday. What else did you have? And then you start to realize that you've been running in your life off of everything else but water. You've been running off of everything that gives you a caffeine hit, right, or a sugar high, or coffee that'll wake you up and then the downers, the melatonin, make you go to sleep at night. Right? You're running on everything except water. There's danger of that. 
You don't start painting the first time you miss a cup of water. May not start painting the second time you miss a cup of water. But if your water intake is consistently low, your body's going to start letting you know. And see, nowadays we got all these things that'll make headaches go away, or they'll make medicine to keep you from cramping. Right? They'll make what medicine to wake you up in the morning, medicine to put you to sleep at night. There are signs of dehydration that long before you start painting, it's evident. Right? You ever seen somebody that the skin looks like it came off of a lizard? Chances are they're dehydrated or they've been left out in the sun too long. But one of the first things is that your skin's going to start flaking and peeling and scabbing. Right? Lotion's good, but you know what else is better? If you moisturize it from the inside with water. Right? Your body's going to start cramping when yesterday, it was the same thing you did yesterday. You're not putting any more effort in than you did yesterday. But all of a sudden, your muscles don't want to do what they were able to do yesterday. That cramp is a message to you that you don't have the strength to do it. You need some water. Your muscles build up this thing called lactic acid. That's one, what makes you cramp. But two, it's also after you work out is what makes you sore the next day. Okay? But that acid, the reason that your muscles are sore and they feel like they're burning, it's because those acids have chewed away at a little bit of stuff. But if your muscles have been chewed away at for a long time, when you go to use them again, they're going to lock up and say, we can't go no more. We physically cannot go another step. Well, you can work through that for a minute, but you know what's going to happen eventually? You're going to start painting. And then your muscles don't have the strength to get you to the water. It's when you're in real danger. If you've got constant headaches all the time, check how much water you're drinking. When your brain is starved of hydration, right, it can cramp just like the rest. You know what that feels like? A headache. Your whole body runs off of water. Your whole spirituality runs off of God. It doesn't run off of you. If you were enough to keep you spiritual, you wouldn't need the Holy Ghost and Jesus wouldn't have had to die for you. If you were enough to be holy, right? God wouldn't have had to give us the instruction manual on how to live holy. He made you a new creature, but in order to be the new creature, we have to live by faith through Him. The outward man is not what is holy. He makes us holy robes us in His righteousness so that we can go on and be ambassadors for Him. You cannot keep yourself hydrated. You can't make something that's going to keep you hydrated today and tomorrow and the next day. Even if you're trying to make your own thing to keep you, like all these sports drinks that they got nowadays, Gatorade was one of the original ones. Right? And it only had two flavors. It was orange and lemon lime. Now they got 900 flavors. But the reason they came up with that is they said, we want to keep them hydrated, and we want to do it better than just them sucking down a whole bunch of water. They put extra vitamins and minerals and everything in it. You still know what the number one ingredient in Gatorade is? Water. You can try and improve on it, but you know what you're always going to come back to? water you can try and build your life however you want to build it but you know what you're going to need spiritually water but where does that water come from the living God but then notice he says when shall I come and appear before thee right, think of it this way Anybody ever watch the beginning of a marathon? Because I know nobody's ever sat there and watched for like two hours for that guy to finish all 26 miles of it. But you watch the start or the beginning or the highlights of a marathon, there's not water everywhere. 
along that marathon. They start off, and there's usually a guy from Kenya that gets out to a lead, and he's won every marathon for like 40 years, and that guy's going to win it again, and everybody knows that, so they just let him go. But see, that guy's in great shape. He's going to run 26 miles in two hours. Can you run 13 miles an hour for two hours? Right? But then, when he crosses the finish line, it's not even like, you know, he just ran a marathon. He's just like, oh, yeah, everything's good. Right? And he's trained for it. But even that guy, you'll watch him. When he comes up on water, he's grabbing a cup and he's drinking water. Right? God knows that you need water. God's provided provision for you to have water. Right? The only reason that somebody's thirsty is because they didn't drink of the water of life. The only reason that somebody will die and go to hell is what the sin of unbelief. Everything's been made available. Right? There's nothing wanting for somebody to be saved. All they got to do is choose to be saved. God's got to convict them of their sin, then they got to believe. Now, Jesus finished the perfect work of salvation. Nothing needs to be added or taken away from it. Well, in your spirituality, God knows exactly what you need to stay spiritually hydrated. Right? That water, He's made it available. But see, we also know that God expects effort. God doesn't give you water until you're thirsty. You don't need food if you're not hungry. Why do you think my waist size is as big as it is? Because I eat food when I didn't need it. Right? There are so many times that we think we need, but you don't really need. God said, I gave you enough, and by faith you've got to believe it's enough to get you to the next water table. But the psalmist is saying... When shall I come and appear before God? He's saying, Lord, when's the next water table coming? Lord, when's our next appointment? Because when God gives you a drink, He says, that's what you need. And He knows it's what you need, and He knows how long you're going to get off of it. He knows how much fuel He's putting in your tank. And you know when you're going to get more? When you need more. So why does God let someone get to the point where they're panting before He'll give them a drink? One, it's so that God's people don't take it for granted. We heard not too long ago, preacher preached that message again, you won't miss the water till the well runs dry. Thankfully, our well never empties. There's always water. But, go study it out. Abraham and Isaac, when it says that he redigged the wells of his father, it didn't say he redug the well. Wells, plural. Because he knew that if he kept the sheep in one spot, or the animal, the livestock in one spot, they'd eat all the grass. So he knew to keep those things that God had given him alive, he had to keep moving. Nowhere do you find that a Christian spiritually is ever supposed to be stationary. We're supposed to be moving. Always on the move. So what did God say? He said, I'm not going to give you a well. I'm going to make many wells. Go study it out. They're out in the middle of the desert. But yet, God gave Abraham or gave Isaac a well. So that what? They could refresh the animals. They could refresh themselves. When did they find a well? When they needed it. When did God give them something to drink? Right when they needed it the most. Never a second too early, never a second too late. If God gave you the water tower to carry around with you, it's real easy to be complacent. You know what the danger of sitting under the preaching that we sit under coming in and having great services every week. We think that this is just a water tower. But God says, this isn't a water This is just a well. Throughout the week, you've got to go and you've got to head to your next well. And the well after that. And the well after that. 
Sometimes he may tell you to stand and point at a rock. Next thing you know, a river's going to come out of that rock. Just like he did with Moses and the Israelites. When you need a drink, God will give you a drink. You may come up upon a well that somebody's tried to salt, tried to poison it against you. God may tell you to throw a branch in there, and next thing you know, water's going to be sweet. But the truth is that you can't take the water with you. Water flows. In fact, water, very good illustration in the Word of God, that the washing of the water of the Word, the Word is always changing. Changing to what? Exactly what you need. If you got a drink of the same water that you got yesterday from a river, you'd have to travel downstream. Because if you stayed in the same spot, that's new water. Water's always flowing. Even if God tells you to lay down at the same spot by the river bank where you've been before, the water's new. Every time you get in here, it's new. It's not the same water you drank yesterday. That's new water. Even a well, well water. You know where that comes from? It comes from currents after rainwater's been soaked up by the ground. That groundwater travels because it's got to go somewhere. Where's it headed? It's headed to an ocean eventually. But even well water is moving. That's why well water goes away when it don't rain. Because the ground hadn't soaked it up to pass it back along down through the well system. It says, verse number two, when shall I come and appear before God? In other words, Lord, where's the next well? It's right where it needs to be. But see, when God gave you a drink of water, He knew that you needed that much water. The question becomes, did we waste the water? Because keep in mind, I'm going to take a drink of water. Keep in mind, people on Bible days weren't dumb. When they got to a well, they filled up water sacks. They took as much water with them as they could carry. But see, God by faith hands you the water sack and said, that's what you need. And by faith, I have to accept it and say, yes, Lord. But if I pour out half that water, I'm going to get thirsty before I get to the next well. If I pour out the blessings and the richness and the fellowship of God in my life, I'm going to get real thirsty before I get to the next well. The Esau, who was the hunter, go study it out. His father loved his venison. Why? Because he was the hunter. Any good hunter has some beef jerky stored up for a bad hunting day. You don't go hunting when the pantry's empty. You go hunting when the pantry's getting low. But yet Esau got to the point that the hunter in the family, who was very gifted at hunting, but it was his responsibility to go out and get food for everybody. That's how good he was at it. But Esau goes out. And what happened? He waited too long. He was hungry when he went hunting. And when he comes back from hunting, he's fixing to die. He's so hungry. What happens when you wait until you're thirsty to start headed towards the next well? You're going to run out of water. How much water did God give you exactly what you needed to get back to the well? To go out, live for him, come back, and get refreshed. But if you want to start adding pit stops along the way, you're going to start running out of water real quick. Esau got so desperate, what did he do? He sold his birthright. Study it out under the age of the patriarchs. If you were the eldest, that meant when the father passed away, you became the priest for the family. Esau didn't care about being re having a relationship with God as a priest. He sold it for a, essentially a really bad bowl of oatmeal. But not only that, the double portion. 
Why? Because he was responsible for taking care of his mother and his father's household when he passed away. He wasn't interested in living a life where he would have been responsible to offer up sacrifices for the family. All he cared about was that he was hungry. And also, what brother, if your brother comes unto you and he's hungry, makes him sign a contract before you'll give him a bowl of food anyway. The psalmist says, My soul thirsteth for God for the living God. See, if a deer's panting, it's still breathing. Go home, all y'all that got dogs, get the dog all excited, let it run around the backyard. It'll come back in and it'll be panting. You know what that means? It's still alive. It's going to lay down on the carpet or on you know, a piece of tile somewhere, kick over on its side. <laughs> But the dog's not going to die. If you're panting, that means you've still got enough energy to get back to the water. It's when you get to the point that your tongue cleaves to the roof of your, your mouth, where your muscles are you know, so cramped that they won't bend anymore, that they won't stretch anymore, they won't let you walk. You can't crawl because your very arms are stuck in the position that they used to. That's when you're in trouble. The psalmist here is saying, Lord, I know I'm getting thirsty. And I know without you, thirst is going to turn to death real quick. But see, he says, when shall I come and appear before God? He knows that God has an appointment just with him. He says, when shall I come and appear before God? He knows it's going to happen. He didn't say, can I come? And no, he says, when? Lord, what time have you set aside that we can come and have another meeting that I can get another cup of water? See, if you're running a marathon, it's real easy to lose track of distance. And all you know is, is that that last water table's gone, and you don't know when the next one's coming up. But you do know that if you keep running, you're going to find it. See, by faith, I know God gave me enough to get me where I need to be next. So it's up to me to condition myself instead of saying, has God forgotten about me? Lord, where's my cup of water? No, Lord, when's my next appointment? You don't go to the doctor until you're sick. You make an appointment. Well, every time that I get a drink of water, I ought to know the next time I'm meeting up with God. Don't know about you. Try to start my day off every day having a meeting with him in the Word. But I ought to know when I walk out the house of God when the next time I'm coming back is. I ought to know every time that I say, Thank you, Lord, that was a great cup. Hey, you mind just keeping this with you and filling it up and I'll get it from you next time? Because he's got a cup just with your name on it. How much is in there? Just as much as you need. But see, if you take your cup with you, you're liable to fill it up with a whole bunch of stuff ought not be in there. If you take your cup with you, the stuff that isn't water, but you know, even though that's going to taste bad or I might get sick from it, it may get me another day. Or it may give you something that's going to kill you spiritually. But see, by faith, if you just say, Lord, I'm going to leave this cup here, I'm going to come back tomorrow and get it from you again. Because I know, Lord, that I need you more than I need food or water or anything else. The only life I have in me is because you put it there. So I'm coming back again tomorrow, Lord, to get another drink from the living God. But see, if you get out there, I understand. Sun gets hot. And the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeing whom he may devour. He'll roar and try and spook you, get you to run, waste energy. Try and tire you out. But if you know when your next appointment is, and you didn't make it too far, now I could run today because i got another appointment with God tomorrow. God knew how much I was going to need for today. He gave me enough to make it through today and to get back to it tomorrow. And that's what that painting means. That's what that craving. It's not a craving. 
It's a need. And when we start panting after God like a deer pants after the water brook, that's when revival will come. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.